Let us Hello. kick off today's session. I would like to ask a simple question. How many of you all among the audience today think that you come from an average family and need to work to become somebody in your life? Can I show, see a show of hands? How many of you think that you come from a privileged family? It's okay to work a little less hard, but you will still make it in life. Okay. Clearly, the majority of you all are belongs to the bracket whereby you need to work hard to achieve. This is reflected in a scenario that was calculated and tabulated by many researchers. There are 36 millionaires in the world, and they control 50.1% of the planet's wealth. And these are the minority. If you look at the wealth pyramid, the global billionaire population only represents 0.2%. That means majority of us do not belong there. When you look at the wealth distribution across the world, you notice the concentration of wealth belongs to particular cities. And usually emerging or third world countries are less well-off or affluent compared to the developed countries. What message am I trying to share? However, the good news is global poverty is declining. It means that every day, many people who belong to the hardcore poor get uplifted from their situation. And majority of these people are not people that you think they would belong to the top 1%. Yet, they have rise against challenges that are insurmountable and achieved what they want to do in life. A few of these heroes that I'm going to share with you are those people that actually inspire me. Some of you all might know him. Walt Disney started off as a lowly paid cartoonist. And today, Disney is the biggest entertainment company that controls companies such as 20th Century Fox and Marvels. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Mickey Mouse has ruled the world and defend, totally defeated the Avengers. Then, you all may not be too familiar with this particular doctor, but he is my favorite doctor. Dr. Jonas Salk is the creator of the polio vaccination. I'm sure everyone in, who are born in our country are required to go through this vaccination. It prevents paralysis. So, he was the son of a poor immigrant who can't even afford to go to school. Yet, when he had the opportunity to become one of the richest men in the world, he did not patent his vaccination. So the media asked him why. The only thing he said was, could you patent the son? He believed that the wisdom and knowledge given and granted to him to find this cure for the people is to be given back to the people. And these are amazing people who went through insurmountable challenges in their life, and yet they believed in giving back. Every disadvantage has its advantage. This is spoken by Dutch legend Johan Kraft. Some of you all who knows football, he is the creator of Total Football. Beautiful football, they call it today, a teamwork. His father died when he was 12, and his mother was a cleaner in AX. Why this guy resonates with me? Because I was partially named after him. I was born on 14th of January, and uh, my name, Han, came from Johan Kraft. The next, some of you all might be more familiar. He is Li Ka Sheng, known as the Superman because of his business prowess. Every single dollar in Hong Kong, seven cents goes to him. But he is also widely known for his frugality, as well as his ability to give back to society. Up until today, while most people wear a Patek Philippe or an AP or a Rolex, he still wears a $500 Seiko, which is 30 minutes time ahead of his appointment, so that he will never be late to any appointment. Anyone know her? One of my favorite musicians, Yui. Came from a single family, played guitar by the subway. What people don't know is that he, she actually learned guitar after dropping out of school. Despite having no education, she was found by Sony uh, producer to actually become one of the most iconic pop music stars in Japan. Walter Cronkite, one of the most trusted men in US media. Today, uh, with Trump, everything is fake news, right? But this trusted man was the man who covered World War II, the assassination of JFK, and he always ended with this. That's the way it is. Because he started off being a college dropout and struggling reporter, he knows the reality of life. And back home in Malaysia, we have our own hero. I always regard him as my inspiration, the greatest Malaysian of all time. He was an ordinary office boy who, also from Johor, worked in Mitsubishi during World War II. He built what we know as MAS today, 
Malaysia's shipping company, MISC, the whole sugar business of the country, and most of it are given back to the country today, which is what most people don't know. And then, of course, our own hero, the only commoner to ever become the Prime Minister of Malaysia, not once, twice, at age of 93 years old. So he said this, just as no one can anything do worse to us, no one can do anything to us better than what we can do for ourselves. It means that only you can decide what you want to become in your life. I want to share this, because this is the perception today that most people, especially youngsters, everyone is angry on t Twitter. It all started with Trump. And everyone is happy on Facebook. Everyone is successful on LinkedIn, artistic on Instagram, but jobless on WhatsApp and single on Tinder, okay? That's the reality of life. Now, before I get to myself, I want to ask, how do you define success? Everyone defines success differently. You can be successful if you're rich, you can be successful if you're healthy, if you have social status, if you have a beautiful family, if you can create legacy, and of course, you have a comfortable life. But to me, success means falling down seven times and standing up eight times. And this is the definition that I've always carried with myself. Of course, coming to a TED Talk, I hope you all go away with something. So I devised a very simple formula. I call it the pack theory. You know where a wolf, they work in a pack? The pack theory. So it starts with persistence, follows by ambition, then the common good and kindness. This is a slight improvement to my earlier model. I hope that you all remember this pack theory and move on with this in life. So coming back to me, you must be wondering, what gives me the right to share with you all today? There are so many successful people, and I by far do not consider myself successful at all. But there's a little bit that I hope that y'all can take away. Because just like y'all, I started off very ordinary, from an ordinary family. I went through the normal school system, the government school. You know, this is the story I want to share. But I want to clarify, Vitagen, KitKat did not pay me to advertise. So I'm not sure how many of y'all still drink Vitagen. I do. I remember that growing up, we have very little around the house, but my father made sure that the refrigerator is stocked up with some of the things the children like. So Vitagen is one, one of them. You know the five-pack Vitagen? I only drink one flavor, which is orange. And my dad told me, I can only drink one a day. So one a day, I will share it with my sister. And we have five days in a week. Then grocery comes on the weekend. And then Kit Kat, it comes in four fingers, right? I will share it with my sister, two each. Ice cream, I really like it. And I only eat one flavor, which is chocolate ice cream. Usually I get it on the weekend. If I do well for my spelling, or I probably ended up top of the class or something, or I at least do a house chore. But what I'm trying to share with y'all is this. We do not have a lot to go about. I think most families is the same. But what my father actually wanted to instill in me is to tell me that appreciate what little we have, include sharing it with your sibling. Well, the good thing is today, at least I can have my own Vitagen. I don't have to share with my sister anymore. Kit Kat, I can have all four fingers to myself, and for Ice cream, you will know it later. I actually have it twice a week. Like most Malaysians, I went through the normal government school system. I studied very hard. I got into one of the top universities, uh, studied in LSE and NUS on a scholarship. And then I got called to the Singapore bar, then the Malaysian bar. And I was finally a lawyer. My life was set. You know, maybe in 10 years, I'll open my law firm. But no, I realized that anyone knows the show Suits. I realized not everyone is Harvey Specter. And that's not what law practice is all about. So I chose to pivot. I decided that I know what I wanted to do at 13. I do not want to waste any more time doing something that I will not enjoy for the rest of my life. There is no shame in dropping the glory of being a lawyer and going into taking even a lower paid job as long as I knew my direction was to pursue the dream. So how did I become a chief strategist? I started off being a, a strategy manager at one of the top conglomerates in the country. And of course, I was spotted by the biggest property conglomerate in the country, uh, sorry, in the world currently. It's a Fortune 500 company. And I realized that I had a knack for economics, politics, and social. And together, this is what I do daily. I give interviews to medias. I entertain delegates, ambassadors, world state leaders, and speak at international conferences. One of what I'm most proud of is that when I decided to return to Malaysia, it's because I was really, really in love with the country. This is the country that gave me everything that I know of and who I am today is mainly because of this. I speak four languages and one of the main reasons is because of the diversity of the country. And despite better pay in other countries, Malaysia was still where I wanted to give back. So through my role today, I spearheaded localization strategies and creating a lot of job employment opportunities for locals. In my time, I've raised the local job employment opportunities by 60% to 83% today. And, 
and infusing the Malaysian culture and the local needs. I was the only voice at the board level that I could tell them that this is how we should do in order to embrace and ensure our investment sticks with the government's national agenda. Social inclusion and B40, this is what is very close to my heart. Day in, day out, we talk about making money. But making money, you benefit only yourself. But how do you benefit communities around you? So taking care of the underprivileged and giving back to them through my corporate role and through the funds of my company has allowed me the fulfillment that I cannot attain anywhere else, including UTM. We have a very good scholarship program, which I insisted that we must work with them. Revitalizing a 100-year-old village school so that these people have a roof over their head that is not leaking. And these are jobs of the government, but we, as private sector, and I instilled that my company has to do it. Coming back, this is a bus that some of you might be familiar. It travels from Singapore to, uh, to Malaysia. I spend at least a good six hours on the bus each weekend to and fro. 12 hours for a good four and a half years. And every time on the bus, I always read this. It's not because I want to be like them. It's because there are a lot of stories in there that actually inspires me. And I'm so glad that last year I appeared on Forbes myself. My original ambition was to become a foreign diplomat. But due to certain policies, I was never granted the opportunity. But 10 years later, I got the honor to speak at UN as the youngest and only Malaysian on the panel. And this... <laughs> this was something that I realized that if you don't give up, you have one dream. No matter how hard it takes, don't ever say, let anyone bring you down. And this is the delegation I speak to. Majority of them are world leaders. And when we talk about some of these leaders, I had the honor to actually meet him in person last year after the new government came into place. This year, on behalf of my company, I received the award for the collective and shared prosperity social inclusion initiative that I've done for all uh, Malaysians in my, uh, through my project. And it is a great honor. But failures will always continue to come. I was nominated for the Forbes 30 under 30. I didn't win. But did that set me back? No, it didn't. Then I just received recently that uh, in the Global Alumni Award by uh, British Council, out of 1,200 participants, I was the 21 finalist, global finalist, and the only Malaysian to be received as the uh, award recipient. <laughs> now, this picture, I'm not asking you all to go and buy a lottery, right? So don't get me wrong. I talk, I'm talking about the lottery of life. While you all think that everything is through hard work, I did win a lottery of life. I cannot choose who my parents are or what family I'm born into. But I never once blame what is the situation it may be. And it is my parents who provided a foundation, value, and discipline in me to drive me to who I am. And it's because of this, I realized the importance that we can shape our destiny through hard work. We should never ever blame or be jealous that some people are born with silver spoons. Because good habits and discipline can bring you out of it. I worked 13 hours daily. I took three days of annual leave only in 2018. My average response time on the phone is five minutes, except to the TEDx committee. I sleep six hours a day. I read 10 articles per day. I write two articles a week. I have seven meetups with new people, be it to seek advice or to seek guidance. I watch three movies or shows a week. I have chocolate ice cream twice a week now. I juggle multiple roles, just like some of your TEDx committee today, you know, as a student, as an organizing committee. I do up daily investment and savings accounts for the past eight years, but I do zero exercise. This is bad. What I'm trying to tell you is that 80% of y'all can make it if I can make it. And most importantly, you must be focused. You must know where is your goal. And to me, 90% is hard work. The rest is luck. The harder you work, I would like to think the luckier you become. So, what's next? Some ask me, where am I going? Am I going to continue to take on this corporate role? Is my goal to become a CEO? Well, I have a dream. At 13 years old, I had this dream and I always will keep to this dream. I don't know whether I'll ever make it. Maybe this is my pick. I don't know, but I'll keep trying. So this is what I hope that you all can take away. Dream. Persevere. Stay hungry. Remain humble. And most importantly, be kind. A lot of people, in order to achieve what they want in life, they do unscrupulous things. They do things to get them to their goal. I'm an example that I never ever did anything that was so wrong to get to where I am. You must have the moral compass in you. And if you are kind and you do common good, whatever that you do is for the people and people around you benefit, naturally you'll get to where you are. And this is what I want to share also. No odds are too great to overcome. I mean, 
it's easy to tell me right now because I'm not in your shoe, but I'm an example where I wasn't born with a silver spoon. But some of you may think that, oh, you come from a, a single, family, single parent family, it's hard. How are you going to cope? Or you're so poor. Well, for one, you can develop knowledge. Second, focus on education. Third, most importantly, you must have that common goal. And even, even if you sow for a living, you can become the greatest shoemaker, just like what our own Malaysia Jimmy Choo is. Started out from a cobbler family. And most importantly, just rise above it. Because at the end of the day, you realize that the harder you work, the luckier you get. Thank you.